This is so great to be with you tonight uh, and to be with Itzhak again. Uh, we, we have these wonderful conversations. Itzhak and I have known each other for, I don't know how many years. A couple of hours. Yeah. <laughs> and we, uh, we have these wonderful dinner conversations, which we did for about a minute and a half in, uh, in this wonderful movie about Itzhak called Itzhak. <laughs> that is so good, you gotta see it. Go, go to Amazon or we'll download it, it's so good. This is fantastic, now, now we, we're finished. We just came yeah. here to advertise it. And... No, you know, oh. you know, even the part that I'm not in is good. <laughs> That's something. Now, this is a compliment. So what, it's, our conversation tonight will be a lot like what we have at the dinner table whenever we get together without the spaghetti. And without the wine, Itzhak is a great connoisseur of wine. You belong to that, what is the, the uh, Burgundy ma master drink? What is this, a, these people in well, Burgundy who drink all the time? No, it's, it, you go and you eat a lot of rich food and, and a lot of great wine. So what wines. is it, what, it, what do, you get a ribbon and you- Yes, you get a ribbon with a little cup, you know, and uh, it's a Meshuggahs, you know? <laughs> but it's, it's very nice, you know, and people get together and, uh, and they drink a little and they discuss, oh, yesterday I had a, an 82 Bordeaux that was absolutely amazing. And it's, it's, it was, it's showing very well. It's still a baby. <laughs> you know, you know on my 40th, my 40th birthday, somebody gave me a bottle of 82 Chateau Lafitte. I know that bottle. <laughs> I had never tasted anything like that in my life. And I said, I'm never going to drink anything but this. Two years later, we had to sell the house. You know, this, the first time I had the Chateau Lafitte, you know, that was a long time ago when it was actually reasonable. I remember that my idea of a great tasting wine was Manischewitz. <laughs> you know, and, and so I thought that, oh, well, this might be a really something Manischewitz plus. So you taste this thing and I said, what is this, you know? And then I had to learn to, to forget about my past and look for the future, so. Did you have to learn to enjoy Lafitte? Yes, well, you have to learn to enjoy, you know, it's a, it's a taste thing. Because you know? I, I had an uncle who uh, had, I, I, I had a bottle of Lafitte and I knew he had never tasted it before. And I thought, I'm gonna open this up and share it with him and, and mm. give him something that he'd never, ta and he tasted it and he said, you have any Gallo extra hardy burgundy? <laughs> and then he really gave me a good tip. He said, let me give you a tip. When you have a glass of wine, put an ice cube in it this way. <laughs> this way you'll never get bombed. <laughs> have you ever tried that? No, no, I just, I, I was thinking of doing a spritz, you know, with, with <laughs> yeah, a little, right. you put a little soda in the thing, but you know, that, that goes with sweet wine actually is very good. I know it's a sacrilege. What I'm talking about right now is sacrilege, but never mind. They're going to take your ribbon away if you're yes, not careful. And, and the cup, too. You know, I, what I love, we talked about this on the podcast a little bit. Oh, I have a podcast called Clear and Vivid, and Itzhak was our second guest in the first season, which just ended. Go take a look, li take a listen, I mean, to the podcast and listen to Itzhak. He's so wonderful on the podcast because you're so good at talking. As, as amazing as you are as a musician, you're so good at talking. When did you start talking? <laughs> you know, I've interviewed a lot of people that I get that sometimes. <laughs> you know, this, this is a thing where, where you know, when, when, you, when you play a concert and somebody comes backstage and they don't know what to say because, oh, yeah. because they don't know, maybe they didn't like it and so on. So they look at you and they go. <laughs> and you can take that any way you want. And you know, there are people who go backstage to actors who think that they've got it all worked out. They don't have to like it, but they can say something that will get them past having to talk. So they say things like, well, you did it again. Yes, I know that one. Oh, yes. No, this has happened to me a lot. You know, what, what, you, what you don't want to hear. I, you always tell me, and I always feel that that's such a good thing to even tell my students. You always told me that when somebody plays, whether it's an actor or a musician, 
after they do it, all they want to hear is a wonderful compliment. You got to say, in my opinion, you yeah. have to say, you were wonderful. Terrific, yes. Wonderful, brilliant is okay. Yes. But you got to say you and you got to say were. These are important words. If you say it was, that could be the scenery. Yes, exactly. You got to say you and you got to say were, meaning tonight you were wonderful. And Not also, in general. yes, and also don't say congratulations. No. That's, that's death. You know, the you first know. time somebody said that to me, I nearly cried. Yes. Oh, congratulations. I mean, what? Congratulations of what? What? You mean you made it through? You the, made, it through. <laughs> made it through. the concert. It wasn't so good, but you made it through. But I'm, 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 when did you start talking to the audience? What, was that something you did from the time you were a child and performed? No, no, there no. Was some no. moment when you started. No, it was, it was, you know, I wanted, you know, I was playing something and, uh, and then I said, you know, I would like to explain, you know, what I'm doing and so yeah. on. So it started to do it, and then all of a sudden, you know, I would say something that was mildly amusing, and I got a nice reaction. So from then on, so from then out, I said something that was very mildly amusing. <laughs> you know, and I love that uh, what you said to them in Canada. Oh, that I love that. Well, which which you, which which joke are you talking about? Because so many, you know. I mean, you were playing the chanson sans parole. Oh yes, yes, yes. I was. Well, that's what I do. You know, I I, I played a piece by Tchaikovsky called "Song Without Words," which in in French is "Chanson sans parole." So I tell them that um, Tchaikovsky wrote this for a friend of his who was accused of a minor misdemeanor and put in jail forever and it's called Chanson Sans Parole. <laughs> so now, believe it or not, not everybody gets it, but, but in Canada, they get it very quickly because of the French and English. both languages. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So. so did you ever try that in France? In fr no, never. But I, and I didn't try it in Japan either. <laughs> do you have a harder time getting laughs in Japan? Yes, well, Japan, a lot of, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the funny anecdotes in Japan, you know, you, it's difficult because uh, if they don't speak English a lot. So I, one time I, I did something, I uh, was playing a piece by um, a, a guy named Reese. And it was, and I <laughs> a said- A piece by Reese. Uh, exactly. I was saying, I'm playing a single piece by Reese. So if you do that in Japan, I, I did it one time, and there was, I think, one American there. So because I know, because I said that, and somebody said, like, <laughs> you know, but it was only one person. Maybe you should have played two, then you could say Reese Pieces, and they'd get it. I did that, of course. You did that yes, too. It didn't work. I found out, you got to pick the exact right word, you know? It's, I mean, I, I know that uh, some, some comedians work for years to get the exact right word. Like, for instance, I've been trying to find out if I'm genetically Jewish. I think I am, because my Italian grandfather said our family came from Spain in around 1492, so that pretty much is a good indication. You're Jewish, absolutely. Yeah. So I sent away for um, a DNA test. I, I, I scraped off some of my cheek and sent it away, and the, 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 the analysis came back that I was 4% Jewish and 6% Neanderthal. Uh, but that's okay because it's the Ashkenazi Neanderthals. There was a funny one. I like that. I'll use it. <laughs> so the reason that I found that out the other day is I've been saying before that the uh, Ginsburg Neanderthals, that just got a mild laugh. Tried the Goldberg, the end, it didn't get, didn't work. Said Ashkenazi, the end, it told that, boom, you know why? It's got a K in it. <laughs> you look, Neil Simon had that theory that words with K's in them are funnier than words without K's. Okay. You see the incredible laugh you got there? That's right. If you had said, all right, forget it. Exactly. That was good. We didn't work on this. We should do that more often. That's, we didn't I work like on that. anything. That's you said something to me backstage that I thought, oh, this would be good to talk about out on the stage. What did you say? I forget. No, no. I, I said that we should not, not talk about it because we should save it to talk about here. But since you don't remember, 
No, I'm, I'm always curious as to what happens to an actor, on, on, for example, on Broadway, because that always uh, 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 fascinates me as to how you perform and how does the audience affect your performance. This is what I'm always wondering about you with the violin. It's very interesting. That <clears throat> for us, your focus is on the other actor. If you're talking to the audience, you have one of those parts where you talk to the audience, then your focus is directly on, for me anyway, the focus is directly on them. But if I'm with another player, I'm so, I'm, it's like, I think it's like chamber music for you. I'm taking everything I do off of you. I respond to you, you hopefully you respond to me, and something happens between us that couldn't happen alone. So has it ever happened, for example, that you are working with somebody and that person is just, something is wrong with the energy or whatever it is, and you're saying, you uh-oh, I'm in trouble and yeah, I'm gonna do you're something. In, you're, in, you're in business for yourself at yeah, that point. Right. One night in summer stock, when I was in my early 20s, the other actor came on stage completely drunk. And he was standing there weaving, like he was just standing there. And I'd say my line to him, and he'd just look at me <laughs> and weave. I had to say his lines and my lines. <laughs> like you say, I know what you're thinking, and then you say his line. That's the worst example of that. But when things go well, you, t you were talking about the awareness of the audience. When well, things go well, I'm, I'm talking about how you, if you have an audience that you know is absolutely right there, yeah. as opposed to an audience that you have to, uh, you know, to, to you know, right. so what, what happens yeah, to your it's performance? A, it's a mistake to try to capture the audience. You've got to meet them where they are. You know, some Saturday night, people used to say Saturday night audiences were going to be great. Mm. And it wasn't my experience. Saturday night audiences had steak and scotch before they came into the theater. So that's difficult. And they're half asleep. And often the man doesn't know why he was dragged to this play. <laughs> so they're in some other place altogether. So you just got to do the play, and if they find it interesting or funny, they will, and if they don't, at least you did the play. So you don't have to try specially. To reach out and you try to- You just do your thing. Right, now does that apply to you in any way? Yes, well, with, with me, it's, it's not just the audience, but it's also the acoustics. Oh, oh, tell about because, that. You know, because sometimes you play in a hall that when you play in a hall that acoustically is, it gives you everything. I like, you know, there are certain halls in the States here that when you go on the stage and you start to play, it's like you're playing the hall. You can do mm. colors, you can do stuff, and then it's just fantastic. Now, on the other hand, sometimes you play in a hall that's like a convention center, and it's very, and it's not, it's geared for, you know, a microphone. You know, yeah. it's not geared for natural acoustics. <clears throat> so, and I always tell my students, I said, if you do, if something like this happen, don't try extra hard. Just do what you normally do. Same thing. You can't try it. Same thing. The, the more you try, the more it looks like you're putting effort into it. It's yeah, not like too, it's just too, too intense. So what about what I, I love to explore with you, and, I, and every time we talk about it, I learn a little more about the similarities between what you do and what I do. I so value spontaneity. I think it's the thing I value most in, in, a, in a performance. Almost any kind of performance. So tell me, how is spontaneity, how do you do spontaneity when you have the script, when you have the lines? Where, where is the spontaneity it, there? If, if we're actors on a stage, right. and you say a line to me, I don't say my next line because it's in the script or because I memorized it. I say my next line because you've said something in such a way that makes me say the next line. Or I want something from you so badly that I say the next line based on that. And if we're lucky, you have the same response to me, and you're changed a little bit by the way I say it. And each night it's a little different. Mm. The, the, the dynamics are a little different. We're saying the same lines, we're in the same part of the stage. None of that is different. So the difference is what? Is in the, 
uh, inflection in the, the voice, the energy? How, how is it different, you know, when, when you are when You know, you're all of those things come out, the energy, the voice, the yeah. inflection. But it's not because you put them there. For me, it's, that's what spontaneity is. It's not because I invent in this moment a way to use my voice. It comes out in a different way because you've done something to me and I'm willing so to... So you're reach. reactive. You are I'm reactive. willing to react. Yeah. Now, how does that compare to what you do? Oh, very much so. You know, I mean, the thing is that I, I've been... You know, I teach every day when I'm in New York. So today I was teaching somebody and I, we talked about reaction to harmony, mm. reaction to material. What is the music? Because some, some people says, what do I do, Mr. P? What, what do I do with this thing? How do you know what to do there? And I say, you have to listen harmonically as to what does the music tell you. And what I do is sometimes I, I make them, you know, I take a, I don't know, a book or something, anything, and I read and I say to them, okay, so there is, there is a, a, a paragraph. And the paragraph says, uh, uh, Mr. So-and-so has been uh, occasionally uh, incredibly uh, uh, involved with uh, whatever. So what is a word that you want to really um, accentuate is incredibly. So you don't say he was incredibly involved. You don't say that. You say he was incredibly involved. Mm -hmm. So there is something that you say if the word tells you to give it a little bit of a, you know, like a, uh, you, you want to get into that word because, or like if they say heroically, you don't just say heroically. You said heroically. Mm -hmm. And that's the way you do it with, uh, with when you play a, a phrase and you have a harmony that you feel is very special. So you just have to play it in a sense. And I say to the students, I say to them, I want to know that you know that this harmony is very special. Uh -huh. And the minute you know that, you will yeah. play it slightly differently because you will be aware of it. You know, this is very much like what my father used to say to me, who um, he started in burlesque 80, 85 years ago. And he told me, if you know it's funny, they'll know it's funny. Mm. And I never believed it because I thought it was telegraphing it and saying it to them. But there's a little bit of that, even though you're, if you want to be straight and deadpan about it, somewhere in the back of your head, you know there's something funny going on. And it's contagious. And the other, the other things that I find in music and I don't know and I'm sure that there is a parallel in acting, is that I always say to the kids that you have to be like a magician. You have to do thing to the phrase that I will not know that you're doing. Mm. That, but all as a listener is that I would enjoy what I hear, but that I will not say, oh, he did this, he, make a, he made a diminuendo and he played now softly, now he made an accent yeah. and now he made this. Yeah, this is a... Whatever you do, it has to be so subtle and yet somebody is going to say, oh, you know, I don't know what it is, but I just love that. This is almost exactly what Spencer Tracy used to say about mm. acting. Act as well as you can, but never let them catch you doing it. Exactly. Right? Same thing. Absolutely. And, and for me... It comes spontaneously up from as much as possible from the back of my head, which doesn't mean I don't prepare. I don't, it's not that I don't study and try to figure out what's going on and maybe even think of some version of how I might do it. But when I'm doing it, I'm beholden to what's taking place. If, if it's a monologue, I'm, I'm, I want to know how this compares with you. You're playing all by yourself. I hear it start to come out a certain way and I go with it wherever it goes. There was a great actor it's called Sam Levine who did Guys and Dolls with my father on Broadway. And I used to stand in the wings two shows on Saturday and Sam Levine said the same words every night. He said them in a completely different way. He would follow it wherever it went. And the, the effect on the audience was they'd laugh in different places. Oh, that's great. I love that. That's amazing. It was, I mean, it was each night a kind of improvisation. So, so what do you do? You're playing a piece of Bach. Mm. 
How much do you allow yourself to interpret the Bach your way to find out where it's going and still be playing Bach? Well, Bach is a terrible example. Oh. <laughs> and, I, and I'll tell and I'll We're a little late, so good night, and I'll, tell you, and I'll tell you, no, I'll tell you why it's a terrible example. Well, yeah, tell me. Because Bach is now, you know, there are so many people playing Bach in different ways. Right. There's no such thing as the right way to play Bach. You know, you have, you know, you have things like uh, early music style where you don't vibrate and <clears> things <throat> like yeah. that. And so, so... All the way to the swingle singer. That's right, exactly. So what happens is that if somebody plays Bach, I would say 50% of the people will say, this was great. And 50% of the people say this was horrible. Because there's nothing, it's never a, a right way to do it as far as style is concerned. So Bach is, you know, I mean, I, I've been accused of playing Bach in a very romantic way. I don't think I play Bach in a romantic way. I think I play Bach in a classic, classical way. So what do I do? Um, again, I listen harmonically. But it's much easier to do it if you play a, a more of a romantic piece, and then there is, you have a little bit more freedom, like if you play something by Brahms, for example. Yeah. So Bra in Brahms, you, you, you yeah. have less, uh, less latitude. Well, you have less correctness, you know, because yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a little freer. It's a little freer. Uh, and that's why Bach is so difficult. It is so difficult, you know, when, when we have juries at Juilliard, you know, Bach is always required. You, you know, you can have somebody playing, you know, Brahms and Bartok and Tchaikovsky, blah, blah, and it comes to Bach, it humbles you. <laughs> it really does, because first of all, technically, it's very transparent, uh -huh. and you have to phrase in such a way that will make sense. And I'm sure that that's good in, that's the, you know, what is the difference? Let's, let's talk a little bit, and I'd like to, your opinion, let's talk about timing. Uh, Anything yeah. about timing that you can tell me? Uh, what's the, well, ask me. What's the secret of comedy? Ask me. Well, uh, <laughs> I see it coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but so so in a in a in, when you do it with with. Okay, here's actor. what I think about timing. Yes. I thought a lot about timing. Yeah. A lot of people think timing is count to three before you say it. They actually have actually heard people. Have, hear that suggestion. No, I think timing is a thought process. You process something as you say it, and it'll be different depending on what comes before it and what's going to come out at the end of the timing. What's the thought process going to indicate is going on inside your head. So timing is not time that transpires. It's part of the process of, of thinking. You think the part that's not funny, the setup, you think the next thought that's silent, and then there's the funny part. And when do you come in with the funny part? That's the thing. Is it, 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 you come in when the, when the silent part is over. I saw, but when is the silent part over? See, yeah. That's the, that's if the something's, question. If something's not happening in the silent part, it's not going to be funny. Somebody will actually interrupt you. Because I, I, I knew an actor who, in conversation, was always trying to use timing. He'd say, I went down to and, uh, and people would start talking. <laughs> because he was mechanically timing the punchline. So no spontaneity then. You know, yeah, it was right. all no, Nothing all, was really happening. You know, you know, in Israel, what they do is they, when they do a conversation and they uh, think about it, they have a thing like, uh, oh, really? That's oh, like yes. yes sorry, sorry. So tell me, so, well, uh, <laughs> no, I think that, can, that, uh, Is that know, the note? No, no. It, when I say it, it's a note, you know. <laughs> Somebody else says it, it's just, uh, you know. <laughs> That's but like that's, in Japan, they say, ano, right? Oh, yeah. Ano. Oh, 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 yes, I don't yeah. know. And, and what do we say? You know what drives me crazy is people say, I mean, here. No, I, you know is another one. I, you know I wouldn't mind, but I mean, you say, ask somebody a question. What time is it? I mean, it's quarter to four. <laughs> I mean is what you say when you've said something that they don't know what you mean, and then you say what you mean. 
You don't say what you mean because you haven't said anything yet. First you say something, then you mean it. I don't know what well, you I mean. Well, I have to go now. Yeah, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> so, what, so do you, when I hear a piece of music, I often hear a conversation, even if it's one instrument. I hear, I hear a statement, like a sentence, and then I hear something coming in under it that says, like maybe the statement is, I think I'm going to go down and something mm. comes in, and says, well, I don't know about that. I don't want to do that. <laughs> right? I do that. You really? Oh yeah, I do that, you know, sometimes. Can you break it down with, a, like, can you remember a, a section that you did that? And what, you, what, you, what did you, how did you do it? Well, sometimes I feel that when you, when you play a phrase and, for me, there, is, there are so many characters in a phrase. So you can have an angry character. You can have a pleasant character. You have a decisive, I like the decisive character. So sometimes you have a phrase that repeats itself. So you say, the first is, you know, you, 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 uh, you, you announce it. And then it repeats it. Then you, and then it comes the third time and he says, and I really mean that. And you have to play that in that way. Yeah. So you cannot just, yes, I know. Yes, I know. Yes, I know. Yeah. So that's what happens, you know, and it can happen in anything, whether it's a Mozart concerto or, or, or a Beethoven sonata or anything like that. But I make it up, you know, and, I, and sometimes I used to, one of my first teachers, you know, she would always say to me, you know that Mozart phrase, do you imagine that there are people in a ballroom, you know, the, the way they dressed during Mozart's time, you know, with the handkerchief and things <laughs> like She would always set up a, a yeah. like a scenario. Was that helpful? What? Absolutely. Well, I, I do it today. I don't know if it was helpful, but I still do it. You know, you, you remind me of the, the question of spontaneity when you did those three statements of yes, I know. Because what interests me is, at home, before you ever play in front of an audience, you might decide it's yes, I know, yes, I know, yes, I know. Yeah. So you might go f generally for that. But when you're in the moment, the third yes, I know, depending on what happens before that, could exactly. be yes, I know. Yes. It's still accentuating it. Or it could be yes, I know. So many different and ways. The, but that's where the spontaneity comes in, I think. And for, so for us, anyway. I don't know. So does the audience affect that or not? They, the audience or is it the, the other actor? Usually it's the other actor, but the audience affects it even in a serious play. Sometimes you know they're emotional because you hear them reaching for their handkerchiefs. I'll tell you an interesting thing. We did a play about uh, Richard Feynman who helped work on the atomic bomb and after the bomb went off and killed so many people in Japan, he, uh, he became depressed. And why did I start talking about Richard Feynman? About, about uh, yes, I know. It'll come back to me later. <laughs> That's funny, I, 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 you know, because I played him on the stage and when I said his name, I started thinking of so many things. Well, the about, reaction, the reaction of, of, of the audience. It'll come back to me. Um, do, do you, do you follow it where it goes when you're playing by yourself in any way? No, there's got to be a, a frame. What do you mean? A frame, you know, in other words, a phrase. You know, you cannot, I always feel about, that one of the great things about a successful phrase is the sensor. You know, we all have to have a sensor when we play. So, all right, let me explain. A sensor is this. Let's say that you have uh, retardando. That means slowing down. How much do you slow down? Mm -hmm. Do you slow down just enough that you will feel that it's slowing down? Or do you slowing down a little bit too much? And you know, I always tell my students, that when you have a glass of water that's totally full, how much water does it take to spill? 
Just cool. one drop. <laughs> Just one drop will tell yeah. the spill. So, and that brings me back to the timing. Yeah. So that, you know, if you sort of do a retardanto and you do it a little bit too much, it messes up the phrase. It's got to be right so that then, then when the audience hears it, they say, yes, that's the way it should go. And that's usually very simple. But you have to have the sense, so you have to have the idea. And, uh, and another thing that's very, very difficult is playing a tune. A Why? Simple, what do you mean? A simple tune. Because every, when, when a tune is beautiful, everybody is trying to do stuff with it. And then you, you, know, you say to yourself, let the tune play itself. The composer knew what he was writing. Just let the tune play itself. Don't, don't try and, you know, it, it'll sound, uh, I don't know if you know the word, ungepatschket. You know, you know what? So that's what it would sound like. This is know. exactly like what a director will say to an actor who's doing so much with so little that all you have to do is do it. You don't have to make something out of it. And the director will say, don't just do something, stand there. Well, that's a good director. Yeah, that's exactly what you're talking. Yeah, about. no, I mean, let it, let it just, let it just play itself, you know. Otherwise, it becomes like, uh, you know, uh, something that's that's not natural. The sensor you talk about—it's funny. I was thinking about that this morning. Uh, I was thinking of Larry Gelbart, who wrote a lot of the episodes of *Mash*, and was a quick wit, and yet I always felt that his mind was producing funny sayings a mile a minute, but he only said ones that were really funny. I think he heard a lot of retorts, he heard a lot of gags coming up in his head, but he wouldn't say the easy ones that anybody would say, an easy pun or something. Yeah. He'd let out the ones that were really special. And it's one thing to have a quick wit, but you might sacrifice for quickness. You might sacrifice taste. True, absolutely true. I, I, you, you're not going to hear arguments from me about taste, you know. But of course, how do you, how do you say to your student, it's not in good taste? Actually, I do say it in a kind of funny way because we talk about slides. You know, when sliding on the violin. Yeah. Sometimes you slide, and it's kind of. A zoe, not in good taste. Yeah. Is there an equivalent of a slide in acting where you do something and you say it's really not, you shouldn't really do that? Is it overly uh, dramatic? Or, I mean, how, how, would you, how would you call someone you say, oh, that, that person really did that's not a, act in good I taste? Can't think of a, I can't think of, a, of a, something that, that's similar, because that, you can call, you, you know what a slide is. Yeah. In, in acting? No, no, I'm not talking about slide, just anything, an inflection or anything that's in bad taste. Oh, oh, sure, well, mugging. Mugging, making faces to try to make it funny when it's oh, I, all you have to do is go through the experience. Oh, I see, I see. So you mean going like something yeah. like that? Oh. Like, yeah, yeah. Like I've been doing all night. <laughs> no, you haven't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You told me once something about taste that I keep listening for and I can't get it, which is you don't like it when Broadway singers vibrate on oh, the yes. last note. Oh, yes. Oh, so yes. Now oh, my God. To don't me why that's don't get me started. I, I want to get you started. I want to understand it because well, I, I hear them. They go, some enchanted evening, across a crowd, get to the very end of the thing. Then they go, whoa. No, they don't do that. What? They, let me tell you what they oh, well, do. Okay, tell. I will tell you <laughs> what they do. <laughs> they, start, they start the thing and they sing and then finally they say, Oh, oh on see, the last note, they, they started yes. in the middle of they the last note. They start with Gornished and they, with, a, with no vibrato and you say, is it ever going to be finished? You know, and finally they vibrate at the end. It become, it's becoming a style. It's yeah. a Broadway style. So now tell me why it's in bad taste. That's I, I don't, don't no, no, I don't, I don't know if it's in bad taste. I just think it's an affect. Ah, it sounds affected. Yeah, ah, and, and it's the same thing in music. You know, it's, well, it is music. You know, it's an affect that a lot of, you know, you don't get me started. You know, I'm a, vibra <laughs> I'm a vibrato uh, nut. A what you know, kind of nut? A vibrato. Oh, right. Vibrato, you know, and, you yeah, know yeah, because yeah, I, I feel it. vibrato is one of the important 
um, musical tools that is not being used enough for music's sake. Now, there's a case of the censor, it seems to me, having a role to play, because I've heard some singers vibrate so much that they're giving me three notes for every one. Yes. You said they used to, uh, I just told today this story, there used to be a conductor by the name of Sir Thomas Beecham, and he, and, and, and he had in his orchestra an oboe player, usually the oboe player gives the A. So, and the oboe players in Europe, they vibrate, uh, you know, they sound like, whoa, 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 you know, very huge vibrato. So the oboe player goes, and he turns to the orchestra and says, pick your choice, gentlemen. Because <laughs> you know, it was so like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, but, uh, but. So how do you judge how much you're going to vibrate and how, how you're going to tone it down? All right, so I'll give you my vibrato <laughs> lecture. OK. It's this my is great. favorite lecture. Vibrato and cornstarch in Chinese food. How is that? That's my, <laughs> that's my lecture. All right. OK, can't wait. So I'll, I'll explain wait, to you. So, next we'll do MSG. Now you're talking. So if we had, if you have, it, it can really do with anything. If you have cornstarch, usually, you know, in, in Chinese food, you sometimes they use cornstarch to thicken it and, and, and just to make it the sauce right. So if you have, uh, if you have Chinese food, do you ever say, oh, this Chinese food has excellent degree of cornstarch. You never say that. You only say not enough or too much. Yeah. See, you never say that. So with vibrato, it's the same thing. The minute you hear the vibrato, something is out of kilter. Uh -huh. The vibrato has to help the phrase. It has to help the playing so that you hear. But, and again, nobody ever comes to me and says, Oh, Mr. Perlman, you have such a wonderful vibrato. They don't say that. You know, I mean, sometimes, you know, you hear a, a student play and he says, machine gun vibrato. It's always too much. Yeah. So, so, I, so I say to the kids, you know, the minute I hear your vibrato, that means they have to adjust the, the ratio of what, how you vibrate so that I can hear the phrase. I, I hear bossa nova singers who, to my ear, don't vibrate at all. And so if that bothers you, then no, something's I wrong. No, I love it. I, oh, it's, right. my, it's a mysterious sound to me. I love, do you know what I'm talking about? I'm, no. No? Okay. <laughs> but I will, I will listen. Listen and I will, for that. And, and I will me, call you know, tomorrow and, and tell you. We show up here at the Y, you'll tell me. I will me. call you tomorrow. I've been always wanting to ask you a question about MASH. And uh, have you had any like episodes where you had to repeat stuff over and over and over until it's just impossible? Or was it all, because it looks so spontaneous, but how spontaneous was it? Or is it something that- Sometimes, if it's a, like on, on MASH, sometimes we would have a scene with a lot of things happening, a lot of physical action happening. And in order for it to get to be really spontaneous, we would have to do sometimes 20 takes. To get spontaneity? To get spontaneity. Now that sounds weird, but so but is it difficult? You, no, the, it's very difficult because this boom, then then boom, 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 boom. You know, all these things are happening in in the uh, the right rhythm, but they can't look like they're happening mechanically in that rhythm. They, they have to come up almost on their own, and yet all fit into a pattern. So you had a director that that uh, make the judgment call as to how, the, or, or did you look at the takes uh, and, and to see what, you know, did you use your own judgment as to yeah. what I you think thought? I was directing the one I'm talking about. You were about. directing, oh good. I, I kind of went for, I, that's a mistake I made and I don't think I'd make any more. I would do fewer takes if I were directing now because it's easier to get to spontaneity if it's really spontaneous. <laughs> So you have to work, you were, like you had to work for spontaneity. That's, that's, yeah, and, that's but tricky. It is tricky because a lot of people, the more they do it, the less spontaneous they get. But I was working with an actor once who was a brilliant actor, but he couldn't remember the lines. The scene, it was him talking for a minute and a half. And I, that's happened to me too. There's no, no shame to that. But I wanted to do the scene in one take, one shot, I mean, all in one shot. He said, why don't you do it in cuts? Then I can just remember three words at a time. I said, no, you, when you do it, great. You got all this energy and it comes, it flows. I want that flow of energy. So he did it 69 times and he hated me. 
He was, but was, was, but did, the, was, final the, the final was one was great. brilliant and spontaneous. That's funny. In other words, he, he got, just gave up. He got on the train and he went with it, you know? And after the shot, I said, that's perfect, print it, we got it. And they said, well, the cameraman says there was a reflection of the mic boom in the, in the mirror. Isn't I that said, the most horrible thing, you know? I said, nobody will notice that. <laughs> it's in the movie. You look at the movie, there's the mic boom in the shot. There's, all kinds of things. If you put it down to one frame at a time, you see, you get your money's worth that way. <laughs> Do you have a machine like that that can put it one frame at a time? Uh, yeah, doesn't everybody? Have no, that? yeah. No, I remember, I remember we used to have, you remember the long playing records? Yeah, the LPs. Used to, the LPs. Um, we would listen to our great, great uh, violinist, you know, and I would always, you know, sometimes you would find that maybe there was a little, a little flub, a little mistake. Yeah. And I would run parties at the house, you know, and play it at half play the, the mistake. speed. Play <laughs> the mistake. Half the speed. <laughs> listen to that. Wow. <laughs> now, what about? Serve the popcorn and everything. Let's listen to that again. That was on the LP. Yes. That was, that was before they could edit them the way they yeah, did. But right now, with the CDs, can do anything. But, I mean, but that's it. do you, when you record in a studio, do you leave little things in that, that sometimes other people want to take out? I try not to, but it's a mistake. It's got to be, it's, it's spontaneity. I was better. expecting a telegram. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. so, 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 you, so you play those little sections over in the edit? Sometimes you do. Sometimes yeah. you do. But, Does but that bother it, you? Do you? Do you feel it it's bothers, mental? you know, but sometimes you say, oh, God, you know. But if you have a particularly great take, then you just said, oh, the hell with it. But that doesn't always happen. You know, I've been accused of over, overly, overly, uh, you know, making sure that everything is right. So repeat it again. It's always a mistake. But, but you do the, try to do the whole thing. Over. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's that makes sense to me because there are things in section K that don't that would, wouldn't be that way if you didn't play A to K differently. That's true. Right? That's true. That's so true. So these are questions from the audience. I'm not answering this. this <laughs> First one I'm not answering. No, just read. This first one is for you. It says, yes. Itzhak, yes. when did you know that you had talent? Is that really? Uh, is That's that what it real? says right there. Uh, well, uh, we can. Uh, you don't have to answer if you don't want to. No, 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 no. I, 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 did not, I did not know that I had talent. You know, people around me thought that I had talent. So I believed them. You know, I mean, like. Uh, uh, people, you, you do know now, right? I, I found out last year. <laughs> That's, do you think talent is the ability to perform, or is talent what you start with and then you make something of it? Well, talent is, is there's some ability to perform, but talent is something that comes naturally, uh -huh. that you cannot teach, uh -huh. and then you have to work. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, I mean, like, it's it's... It's the, the level of talent is, if for me, you know, when, if, when something, some, like sometimes a student plays for me and like the phrase just comes out perfectly, you know, you can't teach that. Yeah. You, you can teach, you know, you can say, oh, do it this way, do it that way, do it that way, do it this way, but it's not treachery. You know, you've got to have something that's spontaneous. So this other question on this, this card is why the violin? Well, I'm Jewish, so I'm gonna tell you, why not? <laughs> you know. Well, you know, you know, uh, a famous violinist once said the violin is because it's easier to carry, you know, as opposed to a piano or something. Like <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, but uh, no, it's it's a question of of hearing the sound on the radio. In my case, and uh, you, when did you find your Stradivarius? Oh, that one. Yeah. Uh, that one is uh, an interesting story. The Stradivarius uh, belonged to. Uh, the great uh, Yehudi Menuhin, and uh, and I was, you know, during the time that I started to play, we all were looking. Pe young people always look for fiddles. They always look, you know. There's always a violin here and a violin there. The the, the, the difference between at that time, you know, I was talking about 40, 50 years ago, is we could actually look for great Italian violins that were sort of affordable, relatively affordable. 
And so I heard about uh, Granary violin, you know, that somebody got, and I approached Menuhin, and I said, I, I heard that he knew the person who bought that violin. And so he talked to me about it, and then finally I said, by the way, what do you play on? So he said, I play on a Stradivarius, and I said, can I try it? So he gave it to me, and he, I played three notes, and I thought I was going to die. You know, it was like, I couldn't believe it. I never heard how, such how a thing. How old were you at that point? About 23, 24, something like that. You know, it was early, early yeah. on. And so I said to him, I said to him, you know, if by any chance you ever think of selling it, please let me know. And he didn't, but he let somebody else know that he wanted to sell it. And, and so one morning uh, uh, I got a call from my friend in London who was watching that violin for me. He was my violin spy <laughs> as to what, to make sure that Menuhin doesn't sell it to anybody else. And, and uh, that was right after we bought a house, so we had no money. And, uh, and so at six in the morning I get the phone call it happened. I said, what happened? What happened? He says, the violin is in my house, and it only goes to you, or I buy it myself. You know? So I turned to my wife, Toby, and I said, Toby, what are we going to do? We have no money. She said, well, so we, we make a loan. So, so I, I paid the loan off last year. <laughs> it was 30 years ago. Anyway, that's oh, my buy story. this movie, Itzhak. You know, this, this has become like, a, you know, like you advertise your stuff, I advertise <laughs> my stuff, you know what I mean? Um, here, what, how would you advise a young professional with a history of performing music and a passion to keep music in their life? What, what, I don't get that. I don't get it either. Well, I was going to say, keep going. Yeah, that's what I would say. Is there any piece of music you haven't yet played publicly that you would like to? No. Me neither. The question is asked of me all the time, too. It says, oh, Mr. Rolls, is there any role you would like to play? No, I, I don't plan on the future anyway. My whole life is an improvisation. So if, like if there's something I want to do, I'll find out about it. You know, that's a good title for a book, My Life is an Improvisation. Buy that book, too. Yes. <laughs> Did you have fun? There's a question that I know the answer to. Did you have fun making the documentary? Uh, yes. Well, you know, I had, uh, for a year, you know, I was sort of, I was being followed. Not all the time, but there was some times that I was being followed. I always like to tell this story because, you know, uh, uh, Allison, who's the director, and she's always followed me, you know, at certain times during the year and so on. And until, and today, when something happens that is particularly remarkable, I still, I'm in such a habit of being followed and I keep going, where's Allison? You know, where is she? Where, is she? where are the cameras? You know, this is the most disgusting thing that ever happened. I need a camera to take a picture of this. You must, you, you must be happy with how wonderfully you, you and Toby both come off in this movie. Well, listen, I mean, we, we are good together. We're Wonderful. very good together. And people say, you know, your wife was absolutely amazing in that movie. You were good, too. You know? <laughs> no, but it's true. You know, I mean, we, we, we make a good... We make, I, think, I think we make a good team. Oh, now, if you know. buy the movie, you can judge for yourself. <laughs> Do you have a philosophy? And if so, what is it? Yes, uh, you have another question? <laughs> uh, wait a minute, philosophy... Uh, yeah, what, what, well, that's very general. It is, but is there some guiding principle you always fall back on that, that has done you a good, a good job? You know what, you, you know, I'll tell you what. Um, it's in deciding what decisions you make in life. And for me, the, my philosophy is when you make a decision, there's no such thing as a gray area. Mm. I don't believe in gray areas. It's either right or it's wrong. Oh, that's it. You know, so if you make a decision, you say, well, you know, it's not, uh, but it's, it's not, or, or like they say, it's not illegal or something like this. I don't believe in that. 
And I believe that, you know, you have to, to, morally, you have to do the right thing. Oh, you mean when they say it's, it may be unethical, but it's not illegal. And it, it can that either, or maybe it's not exactly unethical, but it's a little <laughs> bit like, I don't believe in that. I believe yeah. in, you know, it's, it's either right or it's, it's wrong. Uh, you know. Now we're getting back to the vibrato on the, the, Oh my God, oh, don't get me started again. You know. So I have a similar thing that I guess you could call as a philosophy. Uh, similar to that, which is that I am a big fan of reality. Things are what they are. Mm. And I, I, don't, I, I don't mind denying reality sometimes. I've, denial has been very good to me. <laughs> but, but denial but, is very good for a when, lot of people. Yeah, in I Egypt. know, but when I know something is true and I'm not denying it, you know, without realizing I'm denying it, then I'm a big fan of it. It's very helpful to be to face it, you know? I, uh, but I get the feeling you're that way too. I must be, yeah, sure, yeah. absolutely. You won the, uh, that prize in Israel, what was it called? Genesis. Genesis, Yeah. where they give you a million dollars, yes. right? But you can't keep it. Oh no, it's, it's, I call it the Jewish prize, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they give it to you and you have to give it right back. But you get to choose where you're giving it. You get to choose within reason. <laughs> oh, oh, you have to talk it over with. When, yeah, why well, not? Look, I, I chose to give it to, uh, uh, to things that have to do with disability and with music, you know. Uh. So those are the two things that I'm most involved in and so on. So, so it was good. But as I said, you know, it's, 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 you know, when people say, oh, you know, they give you a million dollars. Oh, my God, this wonderful one. Well, it's, it's, uh, I give it, I give it right back, you which could, is good, you know, You could charity. have made the final payment on the violin. No, no way, no. <laughs> no way, no way. So what can, what, when you give uh, some of that money to uh, a project or, or a nonprofit that deals with disabilities, mm. what, what, do they do what? What? What's well? It depends on the program. It depends what they have. Sometimes accessibility they have school. And that it's a, it's sometimes it's school that that uh, has a lot of uh, kids who have disability, you know, various disabilities. You know, it depends. Uh, you know, it depends on their organization. You know, there's an organization for the blind, for the deaf. You know, for people with disabilities, uh, for people who are. Uh, you know, to help with, uh, you know, with exercise and, yeah. and, and you know, hospitals or whatever it is. You know, that's, there's so many organizations, that are very good ones, that, uh, that you can, um, uh, that you can uh, help. You know, like, I mean, like there's an organization here that says, um, that's, it says concert in, Concerts in Motion, for example. So where you have musicians going into houses where, f and play for people who cannot go out for a concert. So they play, they give them little concerts and so on and so forth. That's, you know, things like that are very, really very... combines music. Yes, absolutely. So yeah. do, you think, do you think the world is getting a little better? I mean, every corner has a scooped out part where a, a scooter like yours can go. But does that mean that the world is getting a little more cognizant of those of us with disabilities a, a little as bit, regular but fellow people. St still, still, there's still uh, ways that people are, you know, I go through horrible uh, situations, you know, where, for example, I check myself in the hotel and you should see the, the, some rooms that, that have been designed by architects who really don't know anything because they have a code book uh -huh. They look at the code book and, you know, and the code book, you know, codes don't apply to everybody. It's, and they're very cold, you know, so if you, if you go, if you have a code where the bathroom needs uh, to be accessible, it says, put two bars and you have an accessible bathroom, you know. No matter where you put them. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's not. So I, I, there's a lot of problems, a lot of problems, and I find that we have to constantly keep talking about it. Yeah constantly talking about because those problems stay. I, I think our, <clears throat> our awareness needs to be changed. I, a few years ago, I had broken my foot on vacation, so I had to take a wheelchair in the airport. And I thought, oh, it's bad enough being well known. Now everybody's going to be staring at me. Nobody looked at me. True. 
you did, as soon as you get in the wheelchair, you disappear. They, you totally, totally. And, and you know, if somebody, especially if somebody wheel, uh, drives you in a wheels you in a chair, the people, let's say if you go to the counter for, the, for your ticket, the, the, the ticket agent will not talk to you. Talks to will you. talk to the driver. Talk to you. <laughs> to the it's a, you know, to the, the person that drives. Oh, or you. driving the wheelchair. Yeah. Yeah. Never where's he going? Yeah, where's he going? Yeah. And then, I, you know, so the other day I was going, the other day was just two days ago. That, that, does that const, constitute the other day? If it was two days ago? <laughs> two days ago. Anyway, so, uh, you know, yeah, I was checking in, you know, I was going with my pianist, you know, and he was saying something about, and this, this woman, she said, where is he going? So he says, why don't you talk to him? She said, oh. <laughs> so I thought you, I, she said, I thought you spoke for him. Thought you spoke for him? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, same thing. I once went on an airplane, and I was waiting for my dinner, and, uh, and it never arrived. And, and so I said to excuse me, sir, but um, uh, where's my dinner? He says, oh, you speak English. <laughs> Because they assumed that I was going with somebody else, that I was just sitting there, and uh, then it, it, a lot of things. Where is Allison with a camera? Oh, you're right. We need, That's we right. Should be in the movie. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a wonderful movie. I hope you get to see it. I, I really. And the podcast. <laughs> Alan's podcast. When when uh, when singers on Broadway get to the end of their song and they sing the last note. Think of me. Think of me. <laughs> At least they know how to end it. We're ending it this way. Well, Thanks, thank you very much.